My name is Gaurang, and I'm a cardiology fellow in the University of Louisville in Kentucky. I'm joined in here by Rola, who is a cardiology fellow at Scripps, and we have Dr. Sunil Rao, who's an interventional cardiologist at Duke Hospital. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Sunil Rao, what did you think of the ACC so far? So I think it's terrific. I mean, it's a great meeting. Um, I think it's uh, full of uh, really good clinical pearls that people can take back uh, and apply in their clinical practice starting tomorrow. It's a, I mean, I'm an interventional cardiologist, so obviously I'm interested in the interventional program. And for interventionalists, it's really a terrific venue. Um, you know, I think the live cases have been really terrific. Um, and I think one of the interesting things that I found pretty rewarding that the ACC di did this year was focus a little bit more on some of the qualitative aspects of medical practice, work-life balance, uh, how people integrate their uh, hobbies into their, uh, into their profession. And that's somewhat unusual in a scientific conference, and I think it's been really popular. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the fellow involvement to the ACC? Yeah, so I do want to point that out. I think the ACC is very fellow focused, and that's really important. You know, there are fellows who are not only just presenting the abstracts that they submitted, but we, there are fellows that are integrated into the sessions too, which is really important. I mean, honestly, for those of us who are mid-career and have been involved with ACC for a long time, the organization is really only as strong as its membership. And it's really important for those of us who've been involved with ACC to make sure that the membership continues to grow. And that's only going to be done if we involve people who are in training. So any advice you have for us fellows to get involved in the ACC? Yeah, so I think it's really important for you to know that there are lots of opportunities. Almost every committee has an FIT spot. So if you're interested in um, research, for example, the NCDR has a spot on the Research and Publications Committee for a fellow. Um, so that's a great way to understand how the mechanism of the college works, how research works. So there are lots of opportunities. The, the key is just, just get involved. And, and even if you apply and you don't get it the first time, you know, you should continue to try and get involved in other ways because um, that really sets up, I think, a future career for someone, uh, whether they're interested in a university-based academic program or in private practice, whatever your particular passion happens to be, I think involvement in the college can really help to foster that. Any questions you think that the fellows can answer in upcoming research? Jeez, uh, uh, we may have to do three or four more videos for that because uh, for yeah, that. there's a lot of questions. I mean, that's what's great about coming to the ACC, right? There are lots of late-breaking clinical trials, and uh, we heard a lot of exciting ones today about low-risk TAVR uh, and about uh, the role of anticoagulation in patients with acute coronary syndrome and PCI. I mean, those kinds of research trials that are presented here, I mean, you're really witnessing history in the making. but. They also lead to other questions, right? right? So a lot of people are thinking about the durability of surgical valves versus TAVR. And as we get more uh, experience with TAVR, there'll be a, an opportunity to do some kind of observational comparison of that. Uh, when it comes to the issue of anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy, you know, how can we drill down which patients benefit from which strategy? I mean, there's lots of questions that come out. And really, the only way you know about those questions and how those questions come to mind is if you come to the meeting and you interact with people, your, your uh, fellows at other programs, for example, and people who are really involved in the clinical research. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Rola. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dr. Rao. Um, just a question about, you know, you're so prolific um, in your field. Um, what advice do you have for fellows who uh, kind of want to have that research track and, and be very involved in that uh, as a career path? So I think the most important thing is to get a good mentor who will help you foster that. I mean, that's, you know, success in any endeavor, whether it's research or clinical practice, really is highly dependent on someone who's going to provide you with opportunities and help you, um, you know, foster your own interests. And also someone who's very honest. I think if you talk to the, the fellows that I've worked with um, on the research side, they'll tell you that when they send me a paper, I'm as honest with them as my mentors were with me. I'll tell you a funny story. You know, one of the first papers that I wrote, I sent to um, I sent to one of my mentors, and he sent it back to me with a single sentence at the top, and it says, "Maybe you should just start all over." <laughs> <laughs> and so I took that to mean that I had a lot of work to do to understand how to write in a scientific style. But it's that kind of honesty that I think that really helps. The other thing is that what I encourage fellows to do, or even junior faculty, is to just keep a running list of questions that come up during the course of clinical care. And if you write down 10 ideas, maybe six of them won't be answerable. Maybe three of them have already been answered. But one of them is probably doable. And if you just continue to do that, then I think it allows you to come up with questions that are of interest to you, that are clinically relevant, um, that a mentor can really help you try and answer. Now, that's for clinical research. For basic science research, it's a little bit different, right? I mean, there's a, there's a well-honed uh, path for mentorship in, in basic science that I think we could really learn from on the clinical research side. Is there anything you recommend in terms of how you sort of organize your time, you know, between the research and the writing and, and the clinical uh, responsibility? 
Well, I, let me add a third element in there too, which is um, family, right? I mean, it's really about work-life balance. So I think um, there are people do it different ways. I'm probably a little less organized than other people are in terms of how they budget their time. You know, my philosophy or my philosophical approach to this is really that family always comes first. So you, you schedule that first in your mind. Um, and then the second thing is really around clinical care because the patients expect that from us, right? That's really the most important thing. And the great thing about clinical research is that you can integrate that into your clinical care. So I don't want to say that it comes last in any kind of hierarchy, but it's simultaneous with the clinical care part of it. Um, how do I organize my time? Uh, that's a good question and something that I sometimes struggle with too. But for me, you know, I've discovered that if it's something that I'm not interested in, that I'm not passionate about, it really feels like a chore. So I try to focus on things and questions and, and um, clinical research that I'm really passionate about. Because then it doesn't feel like I'm spending time doing it. It's just a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that advice. And um, just to wrap up, is there anything that you're really looking forward to uh, in you know the upcoming sessions for the rest of today or tomorrow? Yeah, well, let me uh, talk about today, tomorrow, and then a little bit in the future, too. Uh, and um, so I'm, I think the live case that's coming up uh, the rest of today, there are a couple of live cases that are coming up. I really encourage people to attend those. Um, there's going to be a lot of sessions uh, uh, this afternoon, for example, on career transitions. So that's really important for fellows, I think. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like to be an academic interventionist, for example. And then if you, if the ACC will forgive me, I am going to put a plug in for the SCAI meeting in May that I'm chairing. So I encourage anyone who's interested in interventional cardiology to attend that meeting. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to interview with us. Thank you. Thank you.